Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. financial officer for an INC 5000 company, a fractional CFO for various companies with annual revenues from 3 to 25 million, and is considered one of the first experts in crypto tech strategy. Please welcome the founder of CFO AF, Byron Wolf. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Byron Wolf. Did I get your name right? Yeah, Byron. Yeah, Byron. close enough. As long as you know, I mean, you can call me Brian too. I'm not going to get too offended, you know, but <laughs> it, it happens. <laughs> so, how are we doing? Tell me, how's the day going? Oh man, it's it's a beautiful day. Uh, we're out here in sunny Arizona. the uh, The weather is absolutely perfect. Went out and did a little walk with the dogs this morning. Uh, sometimes you just got to get away from the uh, from the workload. So got that in. Loving the weather. Loving the uh, loving the the style out here. It's it's good stuff, man. So yeah, today's a great day. Great day. You are killing me. It is just absolutely pouring outside in Portland, Oregon. Beautiful Portland, Oregon, as green as it can possibly be. But man, it is raining. So Byron, tell us about you. Give us a little background, family history, education. Who is Byron Wolf? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think I was like almost everybody growing up. Um, I didn't really want to work very hard, but I wanted to have, you know, money to do what I wanted to do. Uh, I learned at a very young age um, that I was a extrovert uh, in the <laughs> insane sense of the term. Uh, and I just, I don't, I don't have bad conversations. So very early on, I figured I could have conversations with adult adults, even as a kid. Uh, I started collecting, um, you know, money for the neighborhood kids mowing lawns. I'd keep $5 of it. They were happy. I made money, didn't have to work very hard. So that was kind of the start of the entrepreneurship leading up through that, uh, you know, college didn't really know hundred percent what I wanted to do. Started another business and, uh, in college, that's why, that's where I discovered that I absolutely hated partnerships, uh, that changed later on in life. Now I love them, but you know, at the time, Bad partnership, Matt. All partnerships are bad. Uh, I can tell that story, but uh, that that kind of started that trend. Went into accounting, learned uh, learned that stuff. Became a CPA. Uh, decided, hey man, I really like working for myself, and so I kept doing small businesses. Uh, you know, kind of stumbled into owning a dealership, set up a leasing company, started uh, helping other people to find success in their business, which led me into coaching and uh, you know consulting. Uh, which eventually landed me in the fractional CFO space. So fractional chief financial officer. So high end advisement for companies, help them to, you know, define the KPIs they need for their business, help them to, to make more money, not only in the revenue, but in the profitability, clean up their cash flow, uh, set their five year exit plan up so that when they're, if they never want to exit, great, you're operating peak efficiency. But if you do want to sell and move out, retire, Five-year plan, you're good to go, and you're going to get uh, top seed at the at the end of that. So that's kind of the the advanced, fast version of, <laughs> of the forty-year life story. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about the current business, the the current company you're doing, CFO AF. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> First, yeah. what is it, and what do you do? <laughs> uh, so we're a uh, we're a fractional CFO, um, you know, provider. We do. Uh, fractional CFO, we do tax plans for uh, high net worth uh, individuals uh, and then businesses that, you know, have the owners. We do the business and the uh, and the individual uh, owners of that business. Um, we do tax credits, so R&D, the RTC, you know, a lot of those credits that are out there, we help you to find those, implement those into your business, uh, scale it, move forward. Uh, CFO, AF. Uh, is exactly what you think. I actually have a <laughs> sign over my, <laughs> my shoulder. Uh, if uh, if anybody is watching, um, if you're just listening, uh, you know you you know what the term means. You know it. <laughs> so, 
So CFOs, you know, you're very focused on revenue. So let's talk about revenue. Why for entrepreneurs, why is revenue so important? So revenue is the start. It's everything. And so there's really three pieces that if we don't have these three pieces under control in your business, you're not going to find success. Like if you do, you're a lottery winner. You just lucked into it. And I, I, those are those stories are really hard to believe and, and really hard to find. So to me, it's revenue, profit, cash flow. So revenue is the start, right? Like, you know, um, if you're out there and you're trying to find success, like you've got to put yourself out there. You got to give yourself opportunities. So revenue is that opportunity. Revenue is the sales. Uh, it's the marketing. It's everything to get customers in the door, get some dollars in the door. So everything starts with revenue. So you get that revenue piece in and now you're making money, right? And so then you go to the next step. It's like, hey, what, what do I need to do here to make a profit? Because realistically, profit is the big benchmark. You know, if you're looking at, is a company financially healthy? Well, if I can only use one indicator, profit is it. Like, that's what I want to look at. How much money are you actually keeping? How much money are you actually making that you get to take home at the end of the day, right? Right. That's that's what's important. So that's profitability. So revenue, you know, comes in. You gotta you gotta watch that profitability. Make sure you're making money. You're keeping money. And then if you're going to run this thing and you're going to have some longevity, you better manage that cash flow. So I mean, it's it's revenue first. What matters? The bench, benchmark, the scoreboard. That's profit. And then if you want to have longevity, you better manage that cash flow because you can be making a ton of money, but if your cash flow is not right, you'll run out of money. And you can't make payroll. And it doesn't matter how much money you show is making on, on paper. You know, if your bank account zero and you can't pay your employees, you're not going to be open very long. Uh, so for me, you know, those three factors, that that's everything. You know, you got to make money. You got to keep some of it. And you got to manage the flow of that cash. That's everything. So, so how do you define, for an entrepreneur, you know, that might be new to this, how do you define cash flow? So cash flow is the money that comes in to the business and the money that goes out in the business. And it's the timing of when that occurs. And so what happens is, is a lot of these new entrepreneurs that I speak with, that I, that I meet with, uh, work with, is they're making good, good money. You know, they're like, hey, man, we did $5 million in sales, you know, $10 million in sales. Like, that's amazing. How much did you, you know, how much profit did you have? Oh, I mean, I'm not really... Sure, you know, we had to cover this and and I think I need to get a loan. And like, you know, it's like, well, do you really need a loan? Because if you really need a loan, it should be for expansion or to increase your operations. You should never need a loan to cover the expenses that are offset to that revenue. You know, those should be growth factors. And I see tons of these guys are like, well, I got payroll coming up, you know, and it's 40 grand and I got 20 grand in the bank, you know, well. Like, let's look at your AR. Like, how much how much do people owe you? Accounts receivable. You know, how much do people owe you? Because if a bunch of people owe you money and you're not collecting that money, that's a negative cash flow item. And if somebody owes you 40 grand and you owe 40 grand out in payroll, I promise you those employees aren't going to take that IOU that you write that's backed by the 40 grand one of your customers owes you. You know, so cash flow is managing that timing, you know, the money that comes in, managing where it goes, managing how it flows out. You know, it's it's looking at if if it takes my client 30 days to pay or it takes my customer 30 days to pay, do I have 30 days to pay my expenses as well? And if I don't, if I got to pay those immediately, are my profit margins good enough that it makes sense for me to have this money out for 30 days? And so managing that, you know, managing those loans, managing those lines of credit so that you're maximizing the return, that that's makes all the difference in the world. And maybe if you're borrowing that money, especially if you're going like an MCA, which is basically credit card rate, if you're borrowing money to cover payroll at say 30, 40% hard money rates, but you got a client that would pay you probably within a few days if you gave them a 2% discount maybe, you know? You need to go for that 2% discount. Like definitely don't need to be paying that 30, 40%. You know, reach out to your customers, reach out to your clients, especially if they're good and say, hey, you know, uh, there's a lot of money that that flows back and forth. I feel like we have a great relationship, you know, because of that. I really want to benefit you and your business by offering you a, a 2% discount if paid within 72 hours, 1% discount if paid within seven days, you know, something like that. 
And so instead of saying, hey, if you don't pay me within seven days, I got to hit you with fees, go the other route and offer it to them, phrase it, phrase it as I'm going to do you a favor because of our great relationship we have. I'm going to give you this little bit of a discount. And I promise, you know, not every one of your client customers is going to want that uh, or be happy to have it. They may just be like, oh, that's great. I still want my 30 days. But some of them might, you know, and that's going to fix a major problem for you. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I see it often. In fact, my wife is the true kind of uh, a negotiator in the house where anytime we get a bill and folks listen at home, this is true with almost any industry. You get a health care bill, you get an insurance bill, call the hospital, call the clinic, call the insurance and negotiate that price. If you're willing to pay cash or sometimes that day, if you're willing to pay that day, they're willing to take it down. There's a lot of people, even small business owners, you go to gas stations even to this day and you'll see pay cash, you get this price, pay credit, you get this price, you know? And yep. so people are willing to negotiate and, and work with you. You just, you just kind of got to ask, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, you, you can't be scared to take chances, you know, and that's one of the big things that I think we miss uh, when we talk about entrepreneurship, is it 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 is risky, right? You, you're going to have to take risks. You're going to have to bet on yourself. But like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, take smart risk. Like you said, go in and ask. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. Okay, you know that's fine. You know, like you're married. You know, which is great. I'm married as well. I've got you know, I love my wife to death. She's my best friend. We've been married for a long time. She's one of the most you know, she is the most beautiful woman on the planet to me, uh, you know, and to a lot of other people too. Uh, and, uh, you know, but like, you know, we didn't get that because we went out and the first girl we saw, we said, Hey, um, you know, could I, you, maybe we go out and maybe, you know, you know, like you got to have confidence and you got to go in and, and I, you know, and I don't know about you, I'll put this on myself. Like, it wasn't the first woman that I asked out. And it wasn't the first woman I dated. Uh, and I got turned down a few times, you know, in that process. In fact, my wife now didn't didn't say yes, you know, in the beginning. It took a while. I had to work towards that. And so, like, if you're willing to do that for your relationships, you're willing to do that for other things in your life, like, take that into the entrepreneur space, too. Like, take risks. Ask for things. You know, you never know what people are going to be able to, to say. Be inventive. Like you said, if you're going in and you're asking for the discount, maybe find something. If the client says, hey, I don't really want a 2% discount, well, maybe there's something that they do. You know, maybe they want a faster turnaround. Does it take you 72 hours to provide your product? So maybe you say, hey, what if I got it to you in 48 hours or 24 hours? You know, would you be willing to, to pay in advance if we do that? You know, sometimes people will pay you upfront, you know, for future product, which is even better. Uh, and if you can get that, that's going to tremendously help your cash flow. So, you know, it's it's that timing. It's it's everything. It's knowing what's coming in, when it's going out, you know, managing that flow, uh, you know. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's what you take home. What are you keeping? You know, like that's what's that's probably the most important thing, in my opinion. You, you know, you're talking about profitability and, you know, talking about, you know, keeping certain things. You know, how what are some things an entrepreneur can do? to proactively break down profitability, to focus on what's truly important? Yeah, now that's great, great question. So there are, you know, the, the basic formula is revenue minus expenses gets to your profitability, you know, base, basic formula. Well, everything in between there from revenue down to profit is expenses. These are the things that cost your, your business money. And so for me, the biggest thing that we do when we start talking to a, a client, you know, a customer is what are your KPIs? What are your key performance indicators? Another way to say that is, you know, what are your rocks? Like, you know, that's, you know, uh, EOS uses rocks. So there's a lot of different ways to say, you know, what are the metrics that directly correlate to you making more money? And so those expenses are the ones we really want to focus on. And you need to know the difference between a variable expense and a fixed expense. Variable being the things that directly change by how much revenue comes in and then fixed expenses. This is going to be like your rent uh, or your mortgage, you know, things that it doesn't matter how much money you make. You got to pay it at the end of the month anyways. You know, like, you know, if you uh, if you're a, a homeowner or you're a renter and you go on vacation for 30 days, good luck telling the bank or your landlord like, hey, I didn't use the house for 30 days. So I'm just going to skip rent this month because I didn't use it. Like, and it, that's not going to fly. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a fixed expense. You got to pay it regardless. You're there or not there. 
you know, if it was too hot, too cold, whatever, you're going to pay it. So that's the fixed expenses. So know what those are and make sure that they relate to how you're doing within the business. There's other things that you can do that are going to be a little bit more cyclical that are good to look at. If there's an expense that is a heavy, heavy expense for you, but your business is cyclical, like you make most of your money in the summer and then the winter months, you don't really do a lot of business. See if you can like lease that asset out to somebody else that can use it in the winter. See if you can find another use for that asset that will create, you know, some revenue flow, turn it into a revenue center, not a, not a cost center. Uh, or see if you can work something out if you're leasing it or renting it or whatever, work something out where you get a better rate for having it just in that term, but they have it, you know, on when you don't need it. Uh, so find solutions there. The variables, you know, you gotta, you gotta stay on top of those because those are going to give you what they call like your gross profits. That's going to be your total revenue minus those variable expenses, those expenses that are directly related to that revenue. Uh, and so, you know, those, that's the, the easiest, you know, indicator to, to move. Uh, you should, you should look at that thing like little, little buttons you can slide up and down that are going to increase or decrease your revenue. And so if you know exactly what those are, you know, the direct relation to your revenue uh, and ultimately to your profit, then you can adjust those up or down depending on your demand uh, and what you've got going on within the business. Uh, and so this is going to be direct labor, uh, your direct costs, you know, things of that nature. Um, you got to pay attention to those. They're they're crazy important. And then know what your fixed expenses are because your fixed expenses, they're going to give you what is your essentially what I call the break-even point. A lot of people use that term, break-even point. And so you know, I've got to make $100,000 this month to break even. If I make $100,000, I make zero profit, but everybody's paid, everything's covered, and I can move forward with this business and, and wait for those good months that are significantly higher than that. If I make under 100000 then that's money that I now owe to my business that I've either got to it's coming out of profits from earlier periods, or I've got to put money in directly myself, or I've got to find the funding or the investor to come in and handle those. So you need to know what your break-even point is, because that is ultimately what's going to determine those fixed expenses and then the variable expenses that go to it. So managing the expenses is is another big, big piece. Uh, and it's, I, I get it. It's not fun. You know, it's not the, the fun part of the business. I really enjoy it. That's, you know, that's why I went this route. Like, you know, I've, I've had multiple businesses started, uh, built, found partners. Some of them still operate. Uh, some of them we've sold, you know, and, and exited. Uh, but I love the finance side. Like to me, it's, it's a blast. I enjoy it. Um, but I get it. Most people don't, most people aren't weird like me, you know, and that's not, <laughs> that's not the fun part of the business. Uh, you know, but if you don't know those things, or you don't want to do those, then find somebody that does or find an outlet you know, for somebody to handle that stuff so that you can focus on the things that you do like. But it doesn't matter. Even if you have a massive team watching that stuff, you still need to be aware. You still need to watch it. I would highly suggest at least once a week, you look at your numbers. Are we in range? Are we where we need to be? You know, if you don't like hard numbers, go to percentages. Hey, I know that direct labor, you know, for my product is at 30%. So if you start creeping above 30%, why are we creeping above 30%? What's going on? Why are we above it? If you're starting to go down, that's fantastic. Hey, why is our labor down? Like, can we do that? Can we do more of that, you know, to get our to get our profitability higher? Uh, so if you can find those little things that that change the metrics, change the, the outcome of the business, uh, those are the ones you really want to focus on. You know, one of the things you talked about, you know, was like revenue and variations of revenue, cryptos, NFTs. Yeah. What are they? Why should an entrepreneur carry? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're coming out. I mean, they are, they're part of our life now. Uh, you know, it was probably four or five years ago that, you know, it was, it just wasn't really a thing. You know, people used it, uh, you know, for like some video game stuff to buy things that they can't really purchase, you know, in the U S so they're, you know, they're on, they're, they're using the crypto kind of on the, the back end. you know, people were hiding some stuff and transferring, but, but crypto is everywhere now, guys. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And so, you know, it's going to be a form of payment that, that almost all businesses will be taking in the next few years. Uh, it's a tremendous source of funding, um, you know, for businesses already. Uh, and I think it's going to continue to be an even bigger play for the funding. 
Uh, crowdfunding, which has become kind of a big thing in the last decade, I think most of our crowdfunding is going to go to crypto because of the ease of being able to do that in the crowdfunding platform. Uh, so it's going to be huge. It's an alternative to the hard money currency. It's much faster for transfer of money. It's it's much safer, you know, with the way that it's held. Uh, you know, the the wallets. If you know what you're doing on this, it's much safer. It's a much better transfer. It it we are becoming a global uh a, economy for sure you know we just continue to get closer and closer to that and so you know having everything and say us dollars or whatever you know whatever currency you currently use in your homeland like that's not going to work right you know because you got conversions but crypto is always going to be crypto you know and so if we know like whatever the equivalent is we know a bitcoin or ethereum token whatever you know you want to use you know what that value is and so now we're able to transfer that stuff very quickly. You know, it doesn't take when you go wire some money, which we do it a lot with our charity, wire, you know, money to another country, you know, that can take 48 hours sometimes. You know, with crypto, it's almost instantaneous. You know, some of them are down to like pieces of a second uh, for these transfers. And so I think as we go towards that, that's going to be a big piece. NFTs are, there's a lot of utility to those. To those. There's holder of wealth. Um, they're, you know, they're being treated as essentially art pieces. So, uh, you know, they hold that, you know, people want those. So they're going up in a value. The big piece of NFTs that I like is the utility piece, um, because they're, they're, you know, they're one of a kind, you know, non-fungal token means that there's no one else out there that's exact same. And so I feel like that's going to be a big piece of like the security and like, the inclusion and in things. And I think when when we really fully adopt the NFTs, it's going to allow us to really segregate some things out um, so that the the access is, is very secure. Uh, and you'll know like right away, okay, I'm in the right room or are you, you know, I'm I'm in the right platform or whatever that is. Um, because of that, that essentially that, that ticket that, you know, that golden ticket, that Willy Wonka ticket that says, Hey, I'm supposed to be here. You know, I've, I've got the golden ticket. And so I feel like those, uh, that utility piece is going to be huge in the space. The metaverse, uh, you know, that's virtual land, virtual real estate. I feel like that is definitely going to be an area where we're going to have uh, a lot more interactions, especially globally, you know, Nobody, nobody wants to be in a completely Zoom world prior to the pandemic. The pandemic forces us into a Zoom world, and like, and everybody's really comfortable on that. We're comfortable with this, but not everybody wants to get up, get ready, get dressed, just to sit in their home office, you know, and and have a Zoom meeting, you know, with the metaverse. Like, and you can do like a background, you can put bunny ears, whatever you want to do on your Zoom, but ultimately, it's still you, you know, even with filters, still you. With a metaverse, you can be whoever you want to be in any form whatsoever, in any place that you want to be, and you can have these meetings, you can interact with people, uh, you know, there's true real world, like, you know, virtual reality, you know, space there, so you can display things, you can show stuff, you can do virtual tours of houses if you're a real estate agent, you know, you can do a true with your, you know, with the, the potential buyer walking through a virtual uh, reality home that that matches up to the real home. I mean, there's just there's so much opportunity there for people to interact without having to go somewhere to interact. And so, if if COVID taught us you know anything, it's that we don't necessarily have to all go into an office. We don't necessarily have to go to everything and meet up for those things. I think human interaction is amazing. I love it. I'm I'm an extrovert, so I'm definitely not against it at all. But there are situations where we don't necessarily have to meet in person. You know, we can meet online or we can meet in the metaverse, you know, and I can wear whatever my avatar is and you can wear your avatar and you can be whoever you want to be, you know, and we can interact in that way. So I think it's a good thing. Going to put on those damn bunny ears, baby. Yeah, bunny ears. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what's interesting, yeah, right. you know, you're talking so much about the future. What are your professional goals? What is what is. You know, what are you looking like in the five the five year goal? I am a huge fan of Shark Tank uh, and uh, and love other it. things like love you know it. like Shark Tank. I yeah, love, absolutely. Uh, love it. And, oh, I, I love these things. So like that is ultimately you know every time somebody says like what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, I mean that's that's what it always comes back to is like I don't I don't want to be like a V you know like a uh, you know, the angel the guy that just. Yeah, I don't want to be a VC. I don't want to just give you money and then like 
expect, you know, a certain, yeah, you know, yeah. demand a certain result. Like, I, I love getting into businesses. So like the concept of Shark Tank where, hey, I'm going to give you money, but I'm going to work along beside you. I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to help you to implement these systems and these processes. I'm going to be with you along the way to find your success. I'm going to be there to celebrate your success with you. I love that concept. And I kind of do that now. Like we currently have 18 businesses that are under our uh, our control or our, our management influence, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I, I, I want to expand that even greater. I want to be able to impact more people, you know, and I, I, that's the, like, that's the vision for me, you know, just having, having the ability to like, somebody says, Hey, this is what I want to do. This is the industry. I can say, I believe in it. I'm going to put money and then I'm going to put you together with these people that are going to help us to catapult this thing. And I'm going to be right there, right there beside you through the whole thing. We're going to find success together. Like to me, that would be the ultimate win or like the ultimate dream job or career or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it. It sounds like you want to create yourself a business business accelerator program. I do. I do. That's exactly yeah. what you want to do. And that's, I. Yeah. You, you would, you can do it. I think you'd do great yep. at it. Thank you. Thank I mean, you. I just the information it. I think that you've provided right now for the listeners is a handful of, of nuggets that they can use today. You know? Oh, I love it. Yeah. Now, yeah, not, I love helping people and like nothing makes me happier than seeing somebody move from something that they do because they got bills to pay, you know, and they got responsibility. If you can move from that into something you love, I mean, that that's the ultimate win, right? Like to me, and I, I, I tell guys all the time, you know, when they first start getting into this, you know, I say, hey, look, if you're looking to go from a 40 hour a week to a 20 hour a week, entrepreneurship's just probably not going to be the answer. You know, it may be way down the line, like when you're ready to exit, but like realistically, you're going to go from 40 hours a week that you tolerate to probably 60 to 100 hours a week that you absolutely love because you're doing that thing that you love. You're building something that's like yours, your baby, you know, your dream, your goals. Like it's going to be more work, but it's, it's night and day difference between doing something I have to do and doing something I believe in and I love. And I like, you know, I'm invested in, that's a big difference. So. That's, that's very true. In fact, you're, you're kind of talking about success, right? What, what does success look like for you? What does, what does that look like? Yeah. I, you know, I keep moving the bar. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm bad about that. I I'll, I'll find success, you know, in 2018, um, you know, I got, I don't want to say lucky, but I, you know, I, I worked my tail off and built one of our businesses up pretty big and, and got the, uh, got the ability to sell out. And so put a million dollars in my bank account. And so growing up that like that, just that word seemed massive to me, just the concept of $1 million. I mean, just, it really felt like, Hey, if I hit a million, I'm done. Like I'm going to own all the planes, you know, multiple islands, you know, I mean, obviously that's not real, but uh, you know, it just seemed like such a big, you know, uh, stepping stone, you know, or, or like, you know, point of achievement. And then we hit it and it was exciting for a couple of hours. And then I'm like, well, now I got to put this money to work. <laughs> you know, and, like, and now I'm worried about, you know, it's not fully covered uh, in the bank. You know, so it was cool. I screenshotted it, million dollars bank account. Very cool. Uh, but then I immediately had to put it to work. And so I keep moving the bar like we've. We're on target this year to do well over, you know, a, a million take home, um, you know, so that that was going to be a huge stepping stone for me. Um, unless something really goes bad this year, you know, we'll we'll be fine. I crushed it in Q1 and that's not even a good quarter for us. And so, I, you know, I keep moving the bar, moving the bar, moving the bar. I think it's really going to be when I can do what we just talked about without really worrying about like how much money it's going to make or like you know, if, if this is going to be a truly, you know, successful venture, if I can find the things that I believe in, I want to be able to mentor, build in, you know, invest in those things and find profit. Obviously, you know, a business isn't a business unless it makes money. It's a charity. Uh, and, and I already have a charity. So as long, you know, just keep those separated, but like, I want to be able to, to do charity when I want to do charity. I want to be able to help entrepreneurs, regardless of what the financial forecast looks like. If I believe in the project, like to me, that's success. It's the success of having the money, the connections, the resources to help anybody that I believe in needs the help. 
you know, or that I believe, you know, deserves the help. Like, not that I would make that judgment 100%, but if it's my resources and my money, then I mean, you know, selfishly, yeah, I want to be able to, I want to be the one that says, yeah, I believe in you. Let's go, you know. And so investing in people, not necessarily businesses, I think that's the big success point for me, you know, is being able to do that. Yeah, you know, I think they say uh, successful people never find success because they're too busy being successful. And it's, I yeah. think what they truly mean by that is true successful people are are never satisfied with their own success that they keep, to your point, raising the bar further and further up. Uh, and, and and you're right. I'm I'm not saying I'm a millionaire, folks. So, hey, listeners, chill out. I am not a millionaire. But I feel like now it doesn't seem like that much money. You know, oh, before yeah. when I was younger, I was like a millionaire. I'm going to buy the private island. And now yeah, yeah. It, it just seems one, it seems obtainable. And again, folks, I'm not trying to say like I'm rich or anything. This is not trying to be all, you know, cocky or conceited or anything like that. I'm just saying these things are also obtainable for you as a listener. You can, in fact, do this. A million dollars is a very small chunk of money that you can, in fact, get to. You know, uh, it just takes some time to get there. You know, in fact, takes you have to market yourself. You have to brand yourself. CFO AF, how do you brand it? How do you market it? How do you get clients? Who are your clients? Like, how do you, what, what is your typical client? Our typical client is a small business owner. So uh, small businesses, uh, you know, that's 45 million in revenue on down. Uh, most of our clients, our customers, they're in that, you know, as low as say maybe 2 million, 3 million annual revenue. Uh, and then go up from there. We have some that are over the, the, you know, the 45 by SBA standard small business, but they're, they're in industries that have lower profit margins. So they're going to be a little bit higher on the revenue scale. Uh, but really just it's, it's businesses that can't necessarily afford the, you know, the six figure CFO that comes in and manages everything and really shouldn't because they're, they're not really at a point where that makes financial sense for them to, to pay that kind of money for that. Uh, looking to set their controls or financial forecast. Most of these guys are amazing technicians. They're amazing at what they do. They're amazing at, at doing the, the, what the business does. Uh, but the, the, how it functions needs work, you know, and we get to come in, we get to work alongside them to set those KPIs, set the metrics, uh, clean up their accounting system, you know, create the uh, the cash flow management that really works for their business, help them to find the funding. So that that's our ideal client. I mean, we're on, you know, Facebook, you know, Instagram, the underscore CFOAF, uh, you know, we're, we're on all the social medias. Um, you know, we're probably not as exciting as, as the TikTok dances, but you know, we, <laughs> we give good value, I think. So, yeah, hopefully uh, me too. Hopefully. Me yeah. Too. Can't, can't compete with those, but, uh, uh, you know, but we're out there on all that stuff. We do a lot of in-person networking. Um, you know, we're, I talk at a lot of events, uh, you know, a lot of the, the zoom online things we're, we're on those. Um, so we're, you know, with Apex, we're with 10X. So we're with a lot of the the really good networking uh, companies. I'll be at Arate uh, a couple of weeks from now. So, you know, we go to a lot of these things. We network with people, you know, in person. I'm a huge fan of giving value first. And so if you if you ever see me somewhere and you see me talking, I'm probably trying to give some advice or some insight into somebody that's asked for it. Like I will give everything away. Like that's never bothered me. Um, I'm a big fan of the give 95% away and just charge for the 5%. That's kind of the, the you know, the icing on the cake. Uh, so I'm that way. Like I'll, I'll work with anybody to try to help them, uh, you know, and, and we do well enough just charging for the 5%, that last little, you know, kick uh, that, that I'm able to do that. Um, thankfully, uh, I'm very blessed to be able to help out a lot of people. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what we do. Like, you know, I, I get in and I talk to people and we get into your business. I'm very, very blunt. Uh, so I've had people be like, wow, that was a lot uh, you know, with me. And I'm like, hey, you know, I mean, you didn't pay for it. So I gave you I gave you both barrels. Uh, so I'm very blunt, you know, but if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you a straight answer. And I'm going to tell you exactly how it is. And I'm going to tell you like what you need to do from a financial perspective, because that's my space. That's where I'm the expert. I don't need to be an expert in your industry. I don't need to be an expert in your company. I'm an expert in the financial piece. Uh, and that's, that's the only advice I'm going to give you. I'm never going to tell you what you need to do for sales, what you need to do for marketing. I'm going to tell you, you know, what you need to do on the financial piece. And then I'm going to help you to get all that stuff together so that you can be the best version of yourself. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's great. You know, and 
what you know you kind of talked about giving advice for entrepreneurs and, and the listeners and things of that nature but what are some common mistakes that you've seen entrepreneurs do in the past that they should avoid partnerships so uh full circle uh <laughs> So when uh, when I was in college, I started a business, took on a partner, very good friend, and I assumed that that is how great partnerships are developed. Very great friends make very great partners. Not true. Uh, so uh, we started a business. It was a successful business, and then our direction changed. You know, he wanted to go a certain way. I wanted to go another. Uh, I created a lot of controversy, and that partnership fell apart. That friendship, uh, unfortunately, fell apart. Um, you know, we still speak, but we're not the same. We went through a very tough uh, period of time where we both felt very right and where we wanted to go uh, and the business just fell apart. And so I know from from that and I have amazing, amazing partners now. I know that the amazing partnership starts with a well thought out and well documented partner agreement. And so if you have a good friend that you're thinking about going into partnership with, do that stuff first, guys. Like. 99% of how the partnership works should be documented. You should have a written, you know, explanation of that, expectations, all that stuff. And then the final 1%, that's where trust steps in and you're and you can really step in and lead with trust to like solve those those high level problems. That allows you to update that as you as you grow, that trust is going to come into play. So I'm not saying go into some business with somebody you don't trust just because the partnership agreement's good. Trust needs to be there, but trust doesn't cover everything, you know. And so if you can do that, if you can have a very, very good partnership agreement in place, set the structure, set your expectations, all that stuff, then you're gonna have great partnerships. Like I said, I've got a ton of partners, 18 businesses we're currently in. I have a lot of partners. I love every one of them. They're all fantastic, um, you know, until they're not, right? But uh, uh, but yeah, right now I love all of them. They're all great. I've had partnerships that have fallen apart. I've had partnerships that have gone bad, but it was outlined. We had a good partnership agreement. So when it starts to go bad, there's that expectation. Here it is. We're going to enact this. You know, we're at a crossroads. I do this a lot for, uh, for, for businesses. I have an amazing client, good friend uh, now that went through this with a business partner, just different directions. Uh, but you know, I was, I knew both of them. So I was able to step in and say, Hey guys, like, let's figure it out. Let's go to the partnership agreement. Let's figure it out. Uh, and they separate and they both do something, same industry, but they do it very differently. And they're both finding success in this. Whereas if they had not, that may have crashed and burned. And that joy that they had in their industry may have gone to the wayside because of that bad taste in their mouth. Uh, so that's the number one, like if you're going to have partners, have a good partnership agreement, you know, trust is everything, but trust doesn't get you everywhere. You know, so have a good partnership agreement, um, manage your cash flow, guys. Like, you know, I know that it's very easy to bootstrap uh, a new business by going to friends and family, you know, and using your own money. But like cash flow is everything. That's not free money. And I promise you, it's easier to get but it hurts way more when you lose that. You know, when you lose family members' money or friends' money, even your own money, it hurts. Like, it hurts bad. Uh, and that's going to create a really bad spot for you with that family member or that friend if you end up losing it. So manage that cash flow. Manage that expectation. You know, that that may be your first investor. Uh, but if you do that well, then they're always going to be beside you. And as you find success, you're going to find success for them. And there's nothing more uplifting than having your friends and family alongside you when you find that success. Uh, so I'd say, you know, be careful with that. Be careful with the money that you that you fund your business with. Um, you know, pay attention to uh, to your pipeline, like your your relationships, your circle is everything. You know, like I, I don't remember the exact phrase, but essentially they say your 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 net worth is your is your network uh, or something similar to that, and that's true. So who you know and and how they can connect you to people outside of that is everything. I'm not saying, you know, start an MLM and like badger everybody to, to buy this or, you know, buy that or whatever. There's good MLMs out there. There's bad ones out there. There's good businesses out there. There's bad businesses out there. But your network is there for a reason, you know, so like utilize your network, but do it respectfully. You know, like there's tons of people that have like I've got a buddy that he's an MLM, but he's very respectful. Hey, you know, just want to offer some value here. Uh, if this is something you feel like would be good for people that you know, I'd love the connection, love the chance to talk to them about it. Very respectful. I love that guy. No issues. I've had people pitch me other MLMs that I'm like, 
delete, block, like don't want to talk to you, you know, like it's a bad situation. So, you know, make sure you're, you're being respectful to your network, but use them, you know, Hey guys, I got a product. If you believe in it, you know, I'd love it if you would just tell other people about it. Cause if you could spend money on word of mouth, every dollar in advertising would go to it every single dollar, I promise you, but you can't. And so it's the most important uh, area that you can market and, and grow your business is with your network, with the word of mouth, with those connections. So like utilize those, but, but be respectful in that process because you know, they're, they're your network, they're your friends, they're your family, you know, they're your connections. Very, very great point. So folks, I hope you're kind of taking notes. Uh, I think two big nuggets to pull out of that uh, one in the partnership piece document, make sure you, you know, you cross the I's dot the T's or whatever the hell the damn phrase is, <laughs> got that little backwards. Nonetheless, you know, just really make sure that you, you accurately document um, the expectations of the partnership, what each individual's roles are in the partnership, uh, the percentage of these partnerships, all that things, those things are so important, a lot of nuances and certainly check with a legal advisor uh, to kind of help you with that. And then one of the things also the networking piece, you know, I, I cannot iterate enough of the importance of networking. I try to do it often. I know probably not often enough, but Hey, you know, sometimes things happen. You got family. That's why the virtual world exists, right? This is why I'm able to be here at this moment. Now, what, what is, how, how can the listeners find you? If they want to contact you, if they want to get involved, they want to learn more about you, websites, social sites, uh, maybe contact information. How can they get a hold of you? Yeah, of course. Uh, they can always go to the website, uh, www.cfoaf.com. So cfoaf.com. Uh, if they want to hit us on Instagram, it's the underscore cfoaf. Uh, Facebook, the same, the cfoaf. Uh, you know, any of those are great ways to get in touch with us, reach out on the website. It's got a little link so you can set an appointment with us uh, for different categories, different things that we have on there. Um, so reach out to me there. Reach out to me on social. Happy to talk to anybody. Um, if you've got a group you want me to talk to, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. I'm always there to give value. Uh, that's that's a big piece for me. Um, it, we did just create a uh, a free like PDF. It's not a it's not a, a funnel. It truly is 100% free. It's just a resource that we'd love to be able to offer to your listeners. Uh, if you're okay with it, I don't want to yes, be presumptuous. Yes, no, by all means. Okay. Uh, so again, it's not a funnel. Um, you just go there. It, it You have to put in your email. So it comes to your email, but it's a big, it's a long PDF. It's called The What If Plan. Uh, so you go to thewhatifplan.com uh, and it's right there. You can download it directly from that. It goes to your email. It walks you through the idea of a business to the exit plan. And so it talks about partnerships. It talks about setting up an LLC. It talks about uh, operating agreements, you know, partnership agreements that are very important. Walks you through the steps of how you do distributions, where the cash goes, uh, so that you're setting yourself up for that five-year exit plan. So it's a it's a quick resource um, for anybody who's interested in business, uh, or if you're already in business, you're like, I don't know if I'm structured correctly. Check it out, thewhatifplan.com. Uh, go there. It's 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 really easy. It's got good information on it, um, and it'll at least give you a stepping stone towards making good decisions, give you a little outline. So, yeah. You you know, you I'll say this is a great opportunity to plug the newsletter because this information will be on the newsletter that you can subscribe at theshadesofe.com. Go ahead and visit theshadesofe.com. Subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You'll have this information. Again, that is thewhatifplan.com. We'll go ahead and have that uh, information on the newsletter. We'll have Byron Wolf's information on the newsletter. I'm really excited uh, about this um, information. Again, I'm going to go check it out and just to kind of see because I'm also unsure where the hell I am at in this business world as everybody else. Is there anything else you'd like to let the, let the listeners know before we go? Uh, I would say if you're if you're not currently looking at uh, tax credits, um, 100% look into it. Uh, Google it. Reach out to me. We'll help you out with it. Uh, we're we're consistently getting a lot of our clients and our customers, uh, you know, money back. That's that's it's. I don't want to say it's free money. It's money that you paid, but it's a refund uh, on a lot of what you spend. Uh, so, like right now, the R and D research and development credit is huge. Uh, a lot of people don't think that they qualify because they're like, well, I'm not making medicine and I'm not tech. That's just not true. Almost every business qualifies for some form of research and development tax credit. Uh, it's up to $1 million back right now. Uh, so that would be the last two years uh, and, and or sorry, this year and the two years previous. 
those culminate into a million dollars that a business could be getting back uh, from the IRS. So it's amazing stuff. If you're looking for funding, go internal first every time. There's so many great tax uh, benefits out there for you, tax credits, things that you can be doing within your business to find that money. Um, so I would highly encourage your business owners, look into that stuff um, because it's it's out there, it's for you. And if you're a new business owner, you're on the cutting edge of innovation. Uh, whether you think you're a tech company or not, you 100% are. Um, you're, you're taking risks. So take advantage of the uh, the tax credits, the tax incentives that are out there uh, that allow you to find that success easier. So that's that's huge. Uh, Gabriel, you 100% would qualify because I promise you use some software and some other things in your in your business that would qualify you. I would I would be shocked. Oh, we're talking after this damn show. We're, co- we're talking after this damn show. We're getting ourselves qualified <laughs> for some damn research and development, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. I love it. Byron, I mean, I'm, I'm thank you again so much for this opportunity. I, I was really excited to, to talk to you, and I, it, I'm glad we did because this was a great conversation. We'll definitely have the conversation after this show. Byron Wolf, the founder of Chief Financial Officer as fuck. Don't forget yes. to go check it out. I was going to say, I was going to wait till the end, ladies and gentlemen. Again, please go check it out. You can go ahead and subscribe at theshadesofe.com on the social sites, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and TikTok. You can also check us out at theshadesofe.com. So just go ahead and visit theshadesofe.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the shades of e.com.